So now we really deep dive into security of IT systems. Our next speaker, Fabian Breunlein, he has made a fantastic career so far. He is only 21 years old. He is, by background, a trained uh, IT engineer from the Hasselt Plattner Institute, so he studied there. And right after his studies, uh, he moved over to the security research labs here from Berlin and uh, had a nice uh, research project there focusing on um, payment security. And he found some major security gaps on there, which brought him complete media coverage on all top media. So uh, FAZ, Die Welt, so all newspapers wrote about him, but he also has been featured by the Tagesschau. And we are really proud to have him here now on stage, showing us his experiment or his research work, explaining it, and then also hacking it. And I guess afterwards we might be a bit more, uh, yeah, maybe a bit more secure with what we do than with our cash transactions in stores. So, uh, Fabian, the stage is yours. Please show us what you brought us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, yes, um, my name is Fabian. I'm a local hacker from Berlin. And last year I took some time to investigate the current state of security of the payment systems that we use basically every day. Um, I'm here today to present some of the attacks that we've developed, but um, also to share some learnings um, that I gathered during client projects in the industry. But first off, let's start with some uh, actual on-stage live hacking. What I'm going to demonstrate is uh, the possibility to exfiltrate the pin and the card data that is stored on the magnetic stripe um, of an unsuspecting customer paying, for example, in the supermarket or in the hotel. This all happens uh, remotely over Wi-Fi. So hmm. let's see what we have here. Um, this is a typical setup, um, how you can see it, for example, in a, in a supermarket with some uh, cash station running some old windows and normally uh, shitty cache software, and an external payment terminal connected to that uh, via Ethernet, where all the magic and also security happens or should happen. Now, in addition to that, um, so this, this terminal we got by a payment processor, and it's up to date, and um, it, it's not modified in any way. In addition to that, we have this um, notebook here, which is connected over Wi-Fi to the internal network. And um, here the attacker runs his script. What we will do now. All right. All right. So now the cashier says that um, this customer wants to pay his mate for one cent because it's a special offer with this card. And tries to initiate the transaction. As you can see here, it says, please insert the card, which I will do. And as soon as I inserted my card, um, the card data with stored on the Mac stripe is already there. I insert the PIN number. It's masked with stars, as normally. And when I enter it, here it says, OK, the transaction was successful. And yes, Zahlung erfolgt, it says. So everything was successful. And here is the receipt over one cent paid by card. So that's actually it. It looks so easy on that side. Uh, the customer didn't see any difference. Um, but uh, the, the attacker has the card data and the PIN. So with the card data, he can basically print a duplet card. And with that uh, card data and the PIN, he can then uh, continue shopping in the supermarket, or he can withdraw money at a foreign ATM. So I think the question arises, how is that possible? And to answer that, let's take a deeper look at some of the components involved. So this cashier station talks to the payment terminal via the ZVT protocol. It's designed 20 years ago for a different context, and since then it only has seen minor improvements. But these improvements were on the functional side, just adding more functionality, which can also be misused, as it's the case in that 
case in that attack I've demonstrated, but they didn't add any real encryption or authentication. We also um, took a look at one specific payment terminal model and found several implementation flaws there, one being um, a time-based side-channel vulnerability, it's called. So in, as a result, it allowed us to circumvent one security mechanism they put in place to secure one security-critical functionality of ZVT. And in the end, there is also the Poseidon protocol that the payment terminal uses to connect to the internet, to the payment processor. It didn't play any role in the attack I've just demonstrated. Um, however, we also took a look at that. Um, it's proprietary and only available under NDA and uh, for money. But we reversed it a bit, so reverse engineered it a bit. And we also found several flaws there, which uh, might be even more severe, as you will see in a second. Just to recap that slide, um, the thing is that we, we cannot pinpoint one specific actor, one specific part of the whole chain um, as responsible for the insecurity, but it's really a combination of mistakes made by the people designing the protocols, the people implementing them, the people that should have taken a second look over that, and also the people that are currently operating the network. Now to the second attack on the Poseidon protocol. In that case, not the customer is the victim, but a merchant, so for example, the Aldi supermarket. Um, the general idea is that we clone the terminal of the merchant into our office, and we can then act on behalf of that merchant. And that means, of course, we can pay money to the merchant, but also that we can just print prepaid credit or give ourselves refunds, uh, which then will be deducted from that victim merchant. So we can basically just print money or transfer money uh, on another, from another account to ours. What do you need for that? You basically need four things. And the interesting thing is that you don't have to be a security professional to do that, to perform the actual attack. Really, anyone can do that. The first one being a payment terminal that you can get for 20 bucks from eBay. And then you need three numbers that you put into your payment terminal. The first one is the service password. Um, only technicians should have, and they use it to reconfigure the terminal. However, um, well, if you can Google, you will find that on the internet as uh, there are some leaked documents out there which contain the password. And there are also other ways to, to get to that password. The other one is the ID of your victim's terminal. But this identifier is conveniently printed on every single receipt. And you can also guess them as they are assigned incrementally. So if you know one of these terminal IDs, you know hundreds of thousands. And the last one is the um, TCP port number that your victim terminal is normally communicating with on the payment processor backend. But as there are only like 100 possibilities, you can simply try them all, which takes one or two minutes, and um, then you, you see which one answers differently, which one doesn't answer with I don't know you, and then you have the port number. You simply have your terminal, you type in th these three numbers with the terminal ID being your victim, and then the, the payment processor basically cannot differentiate between your terminal and the real one, and you can print yourself prepaid money, or you can transfer yourself money. So I think the question arises, are these isolated cases, or is there a systematic issue? And to answer that question, let's take a look at what's currently considered best practice in regards to security, and how the payment industry approaches that, in my opinion. What we want are open standards. We want uh, protocols that are open, the specification is open, and people from, uh, from with different skill sets commenting on, on that standard. What we have found, for example, with the Poseidon protocol and also the open payment initiative standard are protocols that are only available under NDA. What we want are third-party people and third-party companies um, checking the security of the systems, or also, for example, uh, bug bounty programs. We have something similar in the industry with the certification process, the PCI certification in, in especially. Um, however, we found that this certification pro uh, checking um, tends towards checkmark testing. And by retesting devices that were already um, certified with PCI, we found that some not so obvious flaws were just missed. And also, um, the people testing the device have to at least partially trust the statements of the vendor. The vendor who, of course, wants his device certified, which could be another conflict of interest. And now the last thing 
something we personally experienced is the response to the researchers once a vulnerability arises. What we want is we want to work together with the affected parties. We want to fix the vulnerabilities and make it more secure. Um, what we found, for example, with the pre-player tags that were presented on the EMV protocol is that the vulnerabilities are often ignored, or in our case, um, at least from some of the parties, the vulnerabilities are also denied. So this all sounds very pessimistic, and <laughs> I don't want to end the presentation on this low note. Um, so there's another slide. What we have seen here today, the whole day basically is that we are in a transformation from the pre-internet traditional banking companies to IT companies and internet startups. And what that allows us is to just drop all the legacies from the 90s and even 80s and build new systems from scratch. This is not a guarantee that they will be more secure, but at least it's a chance, an opportunity to build them more secure. In some of the, um, some of the departments that we have here in, in, uh, in finance, um, we have less regulation right now. And this actually means that, again, we have the chance to maybe find new innovative approaches uh, regarding authentication and security in general. So I think it's just, this is the right audience to appeal to, to if you build some new technologies, payment technologies from scratch, please have someone with um, the state-of-the-art security knowledge in your team and consider it already during the design phase. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabian. Uh, one question. Um, so, if I lose my money by this kind of attack, uh, who then is in responsible? responsibility? That's a good question. So, um, if you didn't, if, if you just signed the receipt, then you have the possibility to get your money back. However, if you paid by PIN, then uh, currently the, the state is that um, you are basically screwed. You won't be able to get the money back because the bank says um, if you are responsible with your PIN and your car data and you don't have them together anywhere, um, there is no possibility uh, that it's the bank's fault, but it's, it's basically your fault. So when you first uh, found out about this security gap, who did you approach first? So the producer of this machine or the banks or...? We went uh, through a route of um, the, the banking association, but uh, in the end, um, the payment processors, so the people operating the back-end systems, um, the, the manufacturers of the devices, and also the banks were involved. So, uh, and how did they react when you told them, your system sucks? Um, we, we tried to responsibly disclose it, and we had um, communication going on. Um, but I, I don't want to speak uh, okay. further about okay. that. Okay, okay. But then maybe uh, one more personal question: When exactly did you find out that you have a passion for hacking uh, cash machines? For hacking cash machines, I think they were on my list for a long time. <laughs> um, but well, like last year, I got the opportunity to actually get one of these devices, as you have to have a company uh, to to order them. Do you the remember one. the first gadget you ever hacked? First gadget. Um, ooh, gadgets. I mean, the first ones were websites. Also a nice gadget. <laughs> <laughs> and mm. Question. Yeah, good question, yeah. <laughs> you can write this in your photo book there. <laughs> and uh, what in the future you would like to hack? Is there anything? Um, yes, there are things. Yeah. Um, but uh, let's, let's see when the results are there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fabian Breunlein. Thank you.